What's the normal derivative and why do we care about it? Watch this video to find out. And before I define the normal derivative, let me remind you of the outward facing unit normal vector to a surface. So suppose you have a region W, kind of like that, and with boundary partial W. Now, in most cases, at every point on the boundary, there is a vector nu that has length one and points outwards and is perpendicular to that surface. And this is what's called the outward pointing unit normal vector. And I know laughs in Möbius, but this is not what we'll consider today. So in fact, let me show you a couple of examples of such outward facing uh, unit normal vectors. So for instance, suppose you have the square, kind of like here, then at this point, the normal vector is just one comma zero because it's horizontal and length one. At this point, it would be zero one. Here it would be um, minus one zero and then zero minus one. And for instance, at this point, it's kind of controversial. Some people say it's not defined, but in this case, I would say is uh, one comma minus one, but because you want it to have length one, it's one over square root of two minus one over square root of two. So that's an example of a unit normal vector. Now, the next one is extremely important and is used over and over again. Suppose you have the sphere centered at zero and radius r. The question is, what is the unit normal vector at the point y? Well, notice this thing here is the point y and the unit normal vector well, it looks proportional because it faces the same direction. So in fact, nu is y, but times some constant. Now, what is that constant? Remember from linear algebra or multivariable calculus, if you want to turn a vector into length one, all you need to do is normalize this vector. So divide by its length. So your absolute value means length of y. So that's very important. If you have the sphere centered at zero and radius r, then the unit normal vector at the point y is just y divided by the length of y. And similarly, if the ball is centered at x, so let's say x and r, well, let's say you have at the point y, then same scenario as before, this vector here, that's just y minus x. And the unit, you know, the unit normal vector is just proportional to this. So in other words, it's just y minus x divided by the length of y minus x. And that is for the ball centered at x and radius r. And one more example, because again, this is very, very important and comes over and over again. So now suppose, again, single variable calculus, we have that y is a function of x. So y equals f of x. Then remember the tangent vector is just a vector one comma f prime of x. Well, the outward facing unit normal vector something like that, what you would like is a vector that um, if you dot it with this tangent vector gives you zero. So one choice would be minus f prime of x comma one. Okay. So that would be a vector perpendicular to this one and uh, it faces up. So that's good. The only thing we need to do is just divide this by the length so what this becomes, nu is minus f prime of x comma one over square root of f prime of x squared plus one. So again, that's just a formula for the 
outward facing unit normal vector in the case that you have the graph of a function. And the nice thing is this generalizes for surfaces as well. So again, suppose that here, uh, it's maybe a bad picture, but assume this is x1 up to xn minus one. And this is your last variable, xn. And suppose that xn, very nice, uh, xn is a function of the first n minus one variables, then we actually get a similar formula, surprisingly. So what is new? Well, look, here we had minus f prime of x comma one. Well, here we just have minus gradient of f. So new is just minus gradient of f comma one. So minus fx one, that that uh, up to f x n minus one. So those are all the uh, derivatives we can take, comma one to make it face upwards. And lastly, we just divide it by one plus the length of the derivative squared. So one plus gradient of f squared. So that's another very useful um, normal vector which arises in multivariable calculus and PDEs. And of course, this generalizes to parametric surfaces as well. If you if let's say you have a surface in R3 that you parametrize by Ru comma V, then the outward facing unit normal vector, it's either plus or minus Ru cross Rv over the length of Ru cross Rv. So a very easy way to find those normal vectors. Last but not least, I promise you, the last thing about this, um, more general than surfaces, I guess as general as surfaces, suppose you have a level surface. So your surface is of the form F equals to a constant. So this is something that was taught in multivariable calculus, but I always forget what is the, again, level surfaces like that. Then what is the unit normal vector? Well, it turns out the gradient for this level surface so the F also faces the same direction. So in fact, the, unit, the normal vector, it's either plus minus the gradient of F divided by the length of the gradient of F. So again, another important formula to remember uh, happens very often in PDEs. All right, now that we define the normal vector, we can finally define the, um, normal derivative. So suppose you have a function u defined on some set w. Then mm, the normal derivative, which is sometimes written as partial u over partial nu, what it is, is just a gradient. So I use triangle, but let's now use, uh, well, should have used triangle, but let's use d. It's the uh, gradient of u dotted with the outward facing unit normal vector on the boundary. Um, see, that's why I spent so much time talking about the uh, normal vectors because the normal derivative is just a normal vector dotted with uh, the um, dotted with the gradient. And what does that represent? So what it really represents is how much you function u changes under boundary. So suppose you have this profile view where this is W and this is the boundary of W. And suppose U looks as follows. So it's like that, but suddenly on the boundary, it pops up. Again, what's popping? Then in this case, the normal derivative should be positive because in some sense, U flows out of this and flows out of W. All right, and on the other hand, what does it mean for the uh, normal derivative to be negative, the normal derivative to be zero? Well, first of all, as I said, if the normal derivative is positive, it kind of means that U flows uh, along the unit normal vector. 
So you kind of, the gradient kind of goes the same direction as the unit normal vector, which kind of means that U flows out. So think of a fluid flowing out. On the other hand, if the normal derivative is negative, kind of means U is going in. So kind of absorbing and think almost like billiards. So you have U that goes there, but then goes back inside. Last but not least, what does it mean for the normal derivative to be zero? It would just mean that u is kind of stuck or constant on this um, boundary. And in fact, which leads me to the next point, why is this useful? So what is this useful for? Well, in PDEs, there's certain kind of boundary conditions. Namely, you have, uh, let's say, some region W with boundary partial W. Just like in ODEs, you put an initial condition. In PDEs, what you can also do is to put boundary conditions. Namely, say U equals to what on the boundary? Now, when you say U equals to a certain function on the boundary, this is what's called a Dirichlet boundary condition. But using the normal derivative, we can define even some other kind of boundary conditions, which is very similar to what I defined before. Namely, instead of saying that the, the, the u equals to a function on the boundary, you could just say that the normal derivative of u equals to a function g on the boundary. And this is what's called the Neumann. boundary conditions. And um, what did I want to say? So yeah, again, it's very useful. For instance, partial u over partial nu equals zero. It means u doesn't move on the boundary. And this is very useful. Why? Because the gradient is a vector. So usually on PDEs, you can't just say the gradient equals to something. But the normal derivative, well, it's nice. It's a number, a scalar, which tells you something about the derivative. So that's why it's nice to say partial u over partial nu equals to a scalar function g. So it's kind of a way of talking about a vector with as much information as a scalar. And there's another. Thing I'll talk about later, but um, another application. But now let's do an, an actual example of a normal derivative. So for instance, there's something in PDEs called the fundamental solution of Laplace's equation, which here is just phi of x. It's just a constant times x to the absolute value of x. On, to the two minus n, okay, where n is a dimension. And the question is now calculate the normal derivative of this fundamental solution phi on a very small ball. So on the sphere centered at zero and radius epsilon. So super, super small. And we get actually something interesting. I don't want to spoil it too much, but a priori, a priori, uh, phi blows up at zero. So it's possible that the derivative also blows up at zero, but we'll see maybe this is not the case. And so in order to do that, let's just use a definition, partial phi or partial nu, that is the derivative, so d phi dotted with the uh, unit normal vector, so let's calculate both components separately. So let's first do d phi. So again, phi, remember, like the above is c times absolute value of x to the two minus m. To calculate the gradient, let's just calculate each partial derivative. So suppose this is the ith partial derivative. What this becomes, it is c, not zero, c to the absolute value of x, 2 minus n, with respect to xi. And then, well, that's just a Chen Lu extravaganza. So c to the 2 minus n, absolute value of x to the, so you subtract 1, 1 minus n, and then partial 
absolute value of x of partial xi. And very important, don't ignore the absolute value is actually super important. One might say it's absolutely important. So what is absolute value here? It's just square root of the sum of squares. So square root of the sum of let's say xj squared, where j is from one to n, over partial xi. And this is another Chen Lu extravaganza. So today is all about the Chen Lu. Well, isn't every day all about the Chen Lu. And what we get is then, so you differentiate the square root. So one over square root of sum of xj squared. And then what you do, you take this sum and differentiate with respect to the ith slot. So you see most of them are constant except the term xi squared which now you differentiate, so you get 2xi. And the nice thing is this 2 cancels out, and square root of the sum of squares, that's just absolute value. So c times 2 minus n, absolute value of x to the n minus 1, times xi over absolute value of x. So in the end, what this becomes, it's constant, 2 minus n, absolute value of x to the minus n times xi, times xi. So what have we found? We found the ith derivative. It's c times 2 minus n, absolute value of x to the minus n times xi, which is the ith slot of x. And therefore, the gradient, you put all of those together. So d phi is just this constant. So c times 2 minus n, absolute value of x to the minus n times x. Because you see the ith component of this is c times this constant times xi. So remember x is x1, x2, da, 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 xi, xn. Okay. So Again, uh, if you put them together, that makes sense. So we found the gradient. And now that was the first thing. And now the second thing is to find the U outward facing unit normal vector. And hopefully you listen to me. But uh, if not, I would like to remind you. So if you have uh, the ball centered at 0 and radius epsilon, so this radius is epsilon, and this is a point x. Then the outward facing unit normal vector, it's proportional to x, but uh, you divide it by the length. So length of x, which I know is epsilon, uh, we'll use that in a second, but uh, we'll just simplify this soon. So again, if you want, it is x over epsilon. All right, and then finally, what is the normal derivative? So partial phi over partial nu. Literally by definition, that is, d phi dotted with nu. So all you do, you just dot those two things. Okay. So what we get is uh, c times 2 minus n, absolute value of x to the minus n times x. And this is dotted with x over absolute value of x. All right, and then what does this become? c to the 2 minus n, absolute value of x to the minus n. And now you dot this. And remember, so this is x dotted with x over absolute value of x. And now remember, x dotted with x is the same as uh, absolute value of x squared, so length of x squared. And so we get c times 2 minus n, length of x to the, oops, mm -hmm. length of x to the minus n, and then length of x squared over length of x, and that's just length of x. And so in the end, you get c times 2 minus n, and then x to the 1 minus n. All right, but what does that become? So remember, we are on the sphere, again, centered at 0 in radius epsilon. So in particular, the length of x is just epsilon. So c times 2 minus n, epsilon to the 1 minus n. 
So I don't know. I kind of told you there would be a surprise. It turns out there's no surprise. So I thought it would be, well, epsilon is small, but we are doing it epsilon to the one minus n. So it actually blows up. Still very useful if you want to prove the, uh, you know, um, what's called, let's say the solution of the inhomogeneous Laplace's equation, or if you want to do the mean value formula, I think. Last but not least, there is a little teaser I want to give you because the question is, why is this useful? Well, I told you it's already useful because of the Neumann boundary condition, but there's also another reason where it's useful. And again, that will be part of another video. Namely, it's useful for integrating by parts. If you want to have a higher dimension of integration by parts, let's say integrating the Laplacian of u times a function v, it turns out the normal derivative naturally appears in that. And again, that's the point for another video, you know, not a cliffhanger, but if you like this and you want to see more math, please make sure to subscribe to my channel.